talk about the future and to talk some more about what we see in the future. I'm very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker for today. He's Steve Wells, Director of Operations, Fast Future Publishing. And he's going to talk about disruption and opportunity, creating a very human enterprise. Steve Wells is a global futurist, and he's with Fast Future Publishing, and he's the co-editor of the books, The Future of Business and Technology versus Humanity, and a forthcoming book titled Unleashing Human Potential, The Future of AI in Business. Steve is an experienced speaker, presenter, facilitator, strategist, and a futures analyst, and a working practitioner. His professional background is in finance, marketing, strategy, and futures research and analysis, and publishing. So please welcome on stage Mr. Steve Wells from Future Publishing. I think when I go home, one of the first things I'm going to say to my wife is look at this video because each time I come through the front door, I want that on first. Uh, what a great welcome. Um, it's really brilliant to be here. I've said to a number of people that until uh, around about February of this year, I'd never been to India before. This is my third visit. Uh, and uh, I'm always fascinated, inspired, uh, and, and so pleased to be here. So disruption and opportunity, creating a very human enterprise. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, I want to put this proposition up there for you. That through the explosion of science and technology developments, humanity and society will change more in the next 25 years than it has done in the past 200. Now, that's quite a bold statement, but I think some of those people who really nicely set me up for this presentation are saying similar things. We've never seen such radical disruptive change that we're seeing now and we're going to see accelerate into the future. So the story that I want to tell over the next half hour or so um, is about the macro context for this period of disruption and opportunity. I want to think about the notion of exponentiality, and we heard a little bit about that from the guys from Deloitte, uh, Deloitte earlier on. What is the technology backdrop? I don't want to spend too long on that because there are people in the room much more capable than I of talking about that in detail. But I did want us to think about what are the business and societal impacts of increasing automation? And what actions could businesses take to create a very human enterprise? And I think the people in this room, given the context of exponential technology development, are very well placed to lead that debate from a business perspective. I'm going to be drawing on this book, which has been mentioned once. Um, I want to mention it now for two reasons. One is after this conference, you'll be able to download a free copy of the book by using the code that's on the screen there. But I wanted also to point this out as an example of exponential thinking. So when we came with the idea of bringing this book to market, we spoke to a number of traditional publishers and they told us it would take you Two and a, half, or a year and a half to two years to bring a book with 30 different authors to market. We ended up with 60 odd different uh, contributors, 60 odd chapters. Uh, it's a 580 page book that really looks across a whole gambit of different industry sectors um, and, uh, uh, and different types of technology. And we ended up with that, bringing that book to market in 19 weeks because what we did was we thought differently. We introduced new processes to the publishing process that allowed us to accelerate bringing that particular product to market. So I'm going to build on that notion of exponentiality through this presentation. But I wanted to start with a bit of a reality check. And we're talking a lot about technology because technology is critically important and because technology is going to play a significant role right across just about everything we do. But let's not kid ourselves that technology is the only thing that's changing. Technology is part of a gambit <clears throat> of different major forces that are shaping the future. Now, technology does play a part. But one of the things that we're seeing is increasing uncertainty. We're seeing a loss of control, an emergence of almost serendipitous type change. We're seeing changes in terms of society and demographic shifts. We're seeing new urban infrastructures in place, changes in terms of energy, the environment, different social systems at play, lifestyle choices, and human enhancement and transhumanism. So there's a whole bunch of different things that are working alongside and in combination with technology. Now, I'm just going to focus down on one of those drivers. 
and we'll use that as context for the rest of the presentation. The first one I had on that list is when two worlds collide. So what do I mean by that? Well, a lot of people are from the physical world, an analogue world. It's localised. We're used to seeing objects, things, making and producing objects, whether they're cars, building a house. We're used to a way of thinking about how we work and how we interact that's based around physical things. But that world is increasingly coming up against a digitised world, a digitised society, part of a global brain, fully connected. These people are different to the first group of people I mentioned. They think differently. They don't see technology just as a tool. They see technology as the answer. They think about data. Data is the new oil. It's what lubricates everything that we do. That's where the value is. Not in the product, not in the physical thing, but in the data and the way that we use it. And that's one of the different things I think that through our businesses we need to think about, we need to be cognizant of, because it's a very different currency than the type of thing that we've seen before, the way that we've run our businesses, the thought processes that we've needed to employ. What does that mean? Well, this date of 2020 um, does seem to keep cropping up, doesn't it? And maybe it means that every sector is going to transform over the next few years. Some businesses in that context, in that environment, may choose to play by the rules of the game, the traditional rules of the game. We've been successful about what we've always done in the past, so we're going to be successful again in the future. That sort of mindset. But new, interesting, exciting, emerging businesses are trying to create a new game. They're coming into the marketplace, they don't tend to be traditional players in these marketplaces, and they're changing the rules of the game to suit themselves, and they're being very successful at it. Now, I think there's a challenge here for existing and traditional businesses, because there's something about the DNA in a new business, bringing a new idea, a new concept to market, that allows them to think differently, allows them to think exponentially, allows them to imagine that data is their currency, not the products that they produce. So how, in our traditional, normal businesses, can we change the DNA? Can we change the way that we think? Can we change the products and the services and the way that we interact with our customers and consumers? Because that's a very deep, culturally-based change that I think we need to make. So I'm not saying that that's impossible. What I am saying is that we need to put a lot of effort into thinking about the culture of our organisations and looking at how and when we interact both with people inside our businesses but also with our consumers and customers as well. At the risk of kind of repeating the two most, uh, most obvious examples of exponential business models, Airbnb and Uber, uh, the thing that they did was they really got inside the head of their consumers. They tried to really walk with them to understand what it is that they value. Once they understood what it is they value, then they developed the technology solution and around that developed their business model. But the start point was really understanding their consumers, really understanding the proposition they wanted to take to them. What is it that I need when I want to book a room? What is it that I need and want when I want to book a car? Now, in exactly the same way, we can look at those examples to see what happens when a new business comes along, thinks differently, thinks like an exponential business. We can also look at a couple of examples where that didn't happen. And the two examples I point to are Kodak and Blockbuster. Now, Kodak initially did not believe that its American consumers would move away from its product to a Japanese product. They were wrong. They continued to do the same things with the same consumers that they'd done in the past, and they lost out big time. The other thing they did is refuse to believe that the digital camera they invented would actually add to their business. They thought it would cannibalise their film business, so they decided to back off from that as well. I think it was in 2013 they emerged from bankruptcy in the States. Blockbuster actually had a partnership proposal on the table from Netflix. The idea of being able to combine offers and services both through physical stores and an online platform seems to Netflix an interesting proposition. Blockbuster turned them down. Netflix are worth about $28 billion. Blockbuster doesn't exist anymore. 
So in the same way that we can see examples of what happens when it goes right, there are examples out there of what happens when it goes wrong. And of course, both those companies that it went wrong for were established companies. So one of the mindset changes they were unable or unwilling to make was how do we change the culture of the organization? How do we realign the DNA to match the new world? This notion of exponential thinking is not just about technology. It is about the way that you think, the way that the mindset of the organization is geared up. Here's an example of, I think it's a Chinese company that can build a 57-story building in 19 days. How do they do that? They prefabricate the materials, the, the building materials in a factory, bring them on site, um, and build the thing there. So it's not necessarily just the use of new technologies, it's actually the mindset change about what's possible when we think differently. When we look at what some companies can do in pursuit of exponential growth, we begin to see how powerful these new ways of thinking can be. So Airbnb, for example, have 90, more, 90 times as many uh, room listings per employee as most normal hotel chains. Local, motor, uh, local Motors, a small American um, automotive company, can design a car a thousand times cheaper and can produce it up to five, uh, between five to 22 times faster than a traditional motor manufacturer. Tesla Automotive, interestingly, um, have recently bypassed, have gone past uh, GM in terms of their market capitalization. And if you look at the number of things they actually produce, there's no comparison. But the future potential of Tesla is seen by investors as more attractive than GM. So there's a lot of examples where we can see businesses have been taking a new look, have been thinking differently, have been looking at new ways to interact with their consumers and customers, bring new propositions to them. But investors like it as well. Look at some of the numbers here between 2011 and 2016 in terms of market capitalization growth. Google now worth five, over 500 billion. Uber, look at the growth, between two and $60 billion across a five-year period. So these exponential business models not only drive out good business outcomes from the point of view of how they interact with their customers, how they interact with their consumers, but they do it through the money they can raise uh, through investor interest as well. So there's a lot of interest in the way that these new companies are moving, what they're doing. So let's think a little bit about the technology backdrop. Because what we're actually seeing is a possibility explosion from science and technology development. And I think this is what is very different. If you think back um, into history, then we've seen radical events that have significantly changed business, have significantly changed industry, from the Industrial Revolution, the introduction of the steam machine, mechanization of farming, um, the introduction of uh, manufacturing production lines, all those kind of things, even the introduction of computers, desktop computing. But up until now, what's happened is those introductions have allowed other jobs to come to the surface elsewhere. So human ingenuity has been able to find new markets, new businesses, and create new employment. What we're seeing this time is something a little bit different. We're seeing a convergence, not only of a few technologies, but a lot of technologies, 3D, 4D printing, nanotechnologies, AI, which, will be, which we've spoken about quite a bit already, human augmentation, robotics and drones, all these things are coming together at once. So we have a very different landscape as far as technology development is concerned moving into the future than we have done in the past. And one of the increasing things that I believe is that it's the combinational power of some of these technologies, so robotics and artificial intelligence, that really start to change the game, really start to give us a different environment than we've seen in the past. There's one area particular, particularly that I think of many people would feel is the blurring between magic and science. Because we're talking about human enhancement, we're talking about transhumanism, the notion of merging people with machines. 
So things around radical life extension, nootropics, bioengineering, genetic modification, maybe genetic modification for cosmetic purposes through a high street retailer in the future. There are already a number of genetic techniques that will allow you uh, to do things like change the colour of your hair. 3D printed limbs and brain computer interfaces. So these are things I think that many people would consider fictitious, they would consider unlikely, but these are all magic to science type technologies, to my way of thinking, that are going to be emerging into the market over the next few years. Another area I particularly um, uh, enjoy thinking about, um, augmented, multi-sensory, immersive technologies. Maybe in the future, when you go to a travel agent to arrange a holiday or a business trip, uh, maybe what you'll be able to do is taste the food, feel the bed linen, smell the fragrances from the room using the technology. Maybe with more immersive types of technology, we won't need to go on holiday. Maybe we can experience some kind of immersive virtual reality type experience in our own homes. How does that change that particular sector? How does that change, first of all, how travel and tourism is promoted? And how does it change the services that maybe holiday and vacation providers give to their consumers? There's also this area where maybe the virtual and the real world is starting to merge. I'm sure a number of people around the room are familiar with Second Life. Now, Second Life you would hardly at the moment describe as a very immersive experience. But as a virtual world experience, it's probably the most successful uh, that we've seen so far. How many people actually realise um, that the internal economy, so the trading within Second Life on Linden Laboratories platform of virtual goods, virtual services, exceeded $500 million a few years ago? So this is not a real world. This is people enjoying um, doing business in a virtual world to the tune of $500 million. So that thing gives us some sense that maybe the world is changing and maybe we have a choice in the future about the worlds in which we operate. I mentioned this company once already, Local Motors. So uh, this car of theirs, uh, this particular model is called Astrati. A number of things that are really interesting about this. Uh, first of all, it's 3D printed. Now, because it's 3D printed, it has about 50 separate parts, 50 components. It's electrically powered. The average family car has around about 5,000. Now, if you talk to um, automotive execs, they would generally tell you that they need around about somewhere between 50 and 100,000 units to go through their plant in order to make the plant profitable. With this car, it's about 10% of that. So what does that tell us about the power of 3D printing to change manufacturing? Maybe you don't need one or two really big plants across the world, um, put the cars onto big ships and sell them halfway around the world in order to sell them. Maybe what you have is a, a network of factories producing these cars much more locally, which reduces the carbon footprint of that particular logistics process. But not only that, what does that change from 5,000 components to 50 do about the supply of components? And this is just one example of how radically, when you start to think about that, 3D printing could change the world. 4D printing is interesting as well, in that 4D printing is 3D printing with advanced materials that can actually change their properties, either as they're used on command based on a different set, a certain set of circumstances. So you saw the example on the screen earlier on about 3D printed clothing. Maybe that, uh, that uh, 3D printed clothing is actually 4D printed and that it starts off at the beginning of the day as a kind of an office type dress, if you wear dresses, um, and ends up some kind of uh, nice slinky cocktail outfit the e for the evening. So there are a number of really radical technologies, I think, that are coming into that 3D, 4D printing space. Um, I've touched very briefly on brain-computer interface. Up to now, we've needed to wear things like this in order uh, that the researchers can map, can think about how um, our cognitive function needs to be improved, um, uh, thinking about things like sensory motor functions. But increasingly, people are starting to say, now, what if we could interface with a device and download our thoughts, effectively download our brain? What if, actually, we don't need a connection even to do that because we can do it wirelessly? What if there is so much knowledge that's available to us, actually, um, we can just download the knowledge we need at any one point in order to complete a particular task in hand? 
So this idea about interfacing with a computer, being able to download our brain, being able to upload information that we want, is something that would radically change a whole range of different areas. Training, education, the way that we work, the way that we employ people. So there are some very radical and different outcomes that could potentially arise as a result of implementing this kind of technology. I don't want to spend too much time thinking about artificial intelligence because um, uh, lots of you will already have been doing this. But what I did want to say is, if we think about the chart that, um, that Deloitte showed us earlier on, where we have this convergence of, uh, of different computing components, things like bandwidth, uh, things like processing, um, if you imagine what happened there with the cost particularly, and then start to think about what that could mean for artificial intelligence, then suddenly we're going to get artificial intelligence capability that's increasingly smarter, increasingly more powerful, and increasingly cheaper. So what does that do with the kind of resources that we have available in our organizations, with the kind of tasks that we can get those machines, those resources to perform for us? And what does that mean for the way that potentially we think about people against machines in the businesses that we're running. Artificial intelligence also enables us to think about whole new business concepts. So there's a lot in the press at the moment about autonomous cars. But what about autonomous vehicles that are effectively self-owned, self-insured? So that changes our notion of asset ownership. Do we actually need to own a car? What other things do we currently buy at the moment that we don't need to own? Because most of the time, when we have a car at the moment, it's actually spending its time parked either outside the office or outside the home. So maybe this kind of technology really changes not just car ownership, but the thought of how we consider assets in the future. So what, can we, what might we start to see as we move forward in terms of people and other things that we might interact with. So we might see a whole new world of multiple actors. We might see a world where there's us, there are enhanced humans, potentially those transhumans. We might be interacting with artificially intelligent robots. We might be interacting with other display-based artificial intelligence ma manifestations. There's a whole range of different possibilities when you start to think about some of the technologies we're seeing and how radically that might change what we do at work. What about when we're going for a promotion but the competitor in that promotion race isn't even a person? It's an artificially intelligent robot. How do you feel about your own enhancement and do you feel the need that you need to enhance yourself in order to compete with the artificially intelligent robot? because the robot probably won't need to go on holiday, won't be demanding some of the things that we might, as people, naturally expect. The Economist, a couple of years ago, asked um, a whole bunch of professionals, they said, uh, what is the probability that your job will be overtaken by robots in the next 20 years? And I think the first few on the list there kind of makes sense, because we're already starting to see that. So telemarketeers, um, accountants and auditors, interesting around some of these service industries that up till now have been largely felt to be protected from automation. We're seeing a very quick take up of automated processes around AI, uh, AI in finance and in legal particularly. Um, we're starting to see more and more of that in the insurance sector as well in terms of assessing insurance claims. So artificial intelligence is getting into these traditional white collar areas. The interesting one for me here on this list, the first interesting one, is airline pilots, commercial airline pilots. So what they're saying is that across this time period, it's 50% likely, they say, that their job could be taken on by robots. Now at the moment, we kind of like the thought that there's someone at the front of the plane capable of taking control. But every time, every time, the majority of times as you hear something about um, some kind of air accident, what's the number one cause of the accident? And it's pilot error, isn't it? So maybe it's not quite so fanciful. 
There have been a lot of studies, I'm just going to refer to two, uh, that, uh, that have looked at the future jobs landscape. This one was uh, Pew Research a couple of years ago. And the question they posed was, will network automated artificial intelligence and robotic devices have displaced more jobs than they've created by 2025? And it's a little way out, but you know, it's not that far, is it? 48% of the respondents said, yes, robots and digital agents will displace more jobs uh, particularly white-collar jobs, than new technology provides. They also interestingly said that were that to happen, there would be significant increases in income inequality and significant numbers of employable people would lead to a breakdown in social order. So the implications of what we're talking about here are potentially really serious. And I'm going to touch back on this a little bit later on because I think this starts to talk a little bit about how business and government in partnership should be thinking about what the implications are here. But in, a, in proportions very similar to the Brexit referendum uh, last year, 52% uh, said, actually, I don't think technology will displace more jobs than it creates. So it's interesting, isn't it? It's very balanced between those that think we're heading for job Armageddon compared to those that take a much more optimistic view, which says that human ingenuity always has created more employment in the past, and I think it will do again. But even in this group, they say, actually, our current social structures, for example, education, are not geared up to cope with that situation. So how might society respond, is my question. What if we transform our organisations but destroy livelihoods through our investment in not just IT, but other technologies as well. So we start to see that maybe through our businesses, maybe through the way that government acts as well, there's some real strong, important, critical, ethical questions that start to arise. One more on some research. Around right about two thirds of primary school children will work in jobs that don't yet exist. So if you think back to that comment just now, uh, about what social systems do we have in place in order to cope with what we potentially see happening in the future. That's really telling, isn't it? So how is our education system bringing young people towards work in a way that's suitable for the work they may have to do in the future? We've spoken a little bit already about how losses in routine white collar office functions uh, will be partially offset by gains around computing, mathematics, architecture, engineering. We're also expected to see jobs that we're currently seeing uh, emerging becoming critically important through to 2020. So how do we leverage big data and artificial intelligence? Um, how do we start the machine learning ball really rolling? How do we commercialize and articulate some of these new business propositions? And the one I'm gonna to touch on a bit more detail a little bit later is this notion of what do we mean by leadership going forward? What do leaders need to steer companies through the upcoming period of change and disruption. Because that's one thing I don't think we hear a great deal of. We hear that there's constant change, but we've been hearing that for a long time, haven't we? We hear that change is accelerating, but actually what we don't hear too much about is, what's the implication on leadership? So we start to think about all these things, all this stuff I've been talking about. I guess in the future we're gonna have some quite interesting personal choices and challenges. So do we want to go for human augmentation or not? Do we want those modifications to be genetic or do we want them to be drug enhanced? Orwell in 1984 and the surveillance society kind of comes to mind as well. If artificial intelligence is a thing that assesses our performance at work, how intrusive will that be? How intrusive could it potentially be in the way that we continue to grow our use around things like social media? The gig economy, if that becomes the norm rather than the exception, how does that change the way that we're employed? How does that change the way that our governments collect taxes? How does that change the way we feel about the way we're connected to whoever we're employed by? Privacy in a digital world is, is interesting. Do we feel that we actually need to meet off the grid to avoid su surveillance? So maybe some of these technologies start to push us towards reconnecting with real people away from the technology. Do, do brain-computer interfaces mean that knowledge is on tap? 
So does that start to challenge our notion of the need for university? Does the idea of assets that I've spoken about already, cars being the example, autonomous vehicles, personal drones, do those, does the nature of what artificial, artificial intelligence could potentially do with those kind of assets change how we think about ownership? How does artificial intelligence drive our life management systems? The artificial intelligence, my personal digital assistant, may know more about me it than my wife does. It will organise things for me, including uh, the anniversary present to my wife. But do we want to give that much over to a digital system of ourselves? And this notion of thinking about baby boomers to Gen Zs within the same lifespan. So at the moment in the UK, we have six generations of the same family alive. If we go forward a few years, given what's happening with retirement age, we could potentially see employers being asked to employ four generations. So given the different needs that we know between baby boomers and Gen Zs, what does that do to the way that we employ them? How does that change the kind of terms and conditions that we offer? Because we need to develop a proposition to bring all those different generations together within our businesses, because they all have a different perspective and different skills to give us. I'm just quickly going to go through some business sectors that we see as changing, because basically it's everything. But it's information and communications technology. You can see the things on the list there, and these are things that you'll be very familiar with. But we'll also see that in production and construction, construction systems and technologies. So advanced robotics and drones, 3D, 4D printing, biomimicry applied to product design, and rapid green and sustainable construction. So we're seeing this sector changing radically as well. We're seeing industry transformation, particularly in white collar work, but also around warehousing, logistics, um, the, the automation of professional services, uh, fintech, uh, as well as other areas. So these changes are permeating sector after sector. Energy and environment, new ways of generating energy. Um, uh, there was a point in April where the UK for the first time didn't use any power from coal-fired power stations. 25% of its energy needs were actually created through solar power. So the increasing of those new energy sources is really beginning to gather pace. But what about things like the way that we care for our elderly? What about things like human modification, augmentation and body shops? What about things like intelligent transport systems? There's a big debate at the moment going on about commuter trains in the south of England. And what they're basically saying is these tra trains need a second person in order to help safety. And yet, the London Underground operates with one person on the train um, and supervision on the platform, and the Docklands Light Railway operates with no people at all. So I think the debate is probably temporary about should we have one or two people on a commuter train. So the macro outlook is volatile. So how is it that we create a very human exponential business? Well, the first thing I think is that we want to get to a place where humans are supported by technology and that technology does not become our masters. <clears throat> and we can see what happens when we start to think like the machines we have in place to help us. There's a mindset blockage. So I, th I mean, imagine most people are familiar with the United Airlines story, uh, when instead of putting the four staff members in a cab and sending them off to Chicago, I think it was, for about $400, uh, they spent around about $4,000 compensating the people that they had to kick and in one place drag the person off the aeroplane, as well as the bad PR that that generated for them. And that's because the people involved in that situation didn't feel that they had the accountability and responsibility to behave to their consumers as people. British Airways um, have had a number of issues recently, but one uh, was the story they concocted to talk about the turning off of a major computer system. Someone apparently um, flicked the wrong switch. There wasn't even an are you sure button to click on, apparently. So these are some of the things that happen if we've got this mindset blockage where we start within our organisations to think like the machines we have to help us. But there are some simple and exponentially impactful solutions as well. This is a great one for when you're queuing up at uh, airport security. If you're lucky enough to be at one of these airports, they've put some of these um, $5 dividers next to the belt. So actually, more than one person at a time can load the trays 
um, uh, for their personal items to go through the scanners. Really, really simple solution, but very effective in helping speed people through what is obviously one of the big bottlenecks in airports. So starting to touch a little bit now on some of the skills uh, that we need. The skills that we're starting to realize, I think, that we need are a little bit different. If we look at the big drivers that we're starting to see in the future environment, we're starting to see some of these things. We're starting to realize what we mean by a globally connected world, and that actually to work in that, we need a different set of skills than we've seen in the past. We're starting to see that around extreme longevity. We're starting to see that around the way that we use media. We're starting to see that in the way that our organizations are changing. What this particular piece of work did was said, OK, if we look at some of those drivers, there are some really quite specific skills that we think we need to put in place. And maybe they're a little bit different to what we've done in the past. The way that I would characterize those is it's a shift from what we think of as ordinary management. So in the past, we've often been quite certain about the outcome that we're looking for. And we've been close to agreement around the kind of problem that we have in mind. Maybe that situation is changing now. Maybe there's much more ambiguity, there's much more uncertainty, and there's less agreement about what we need to do. Now, I term the kind of skills that we need there as extraordinary leadership, because it's really different to what we've done in the past. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean this mindset thing. What are the skills we need to co-create new offerings with our citizens and with our partners? Things like curiosity, sense-making, foresight, accelerated learning, this tolerance of complexity and uncertainty, because we like being sure about things. That's why so many companies look at the signals out there and say, no, we're all right, because our proposition for our consumers is already good. And they won't leave us for Fujifilm, will they? So this tolerance of uncertainty, coping with complexity, are increasingly critical. A big part of that, I think, is future-proof organizations operating across these three areas. So the first one on the left, if you're in business a year after you started, then you're probably doing the operational excellent piece okay. The next stage is to really start to look for growth, and typically we're thinking about one to three years out. Now, it may be an extrapolation of where we've been before, but at least we're starting to think into the future. Many fewer organizations, I think, really start to think, so what's in the future drivers that we can see? How do we understand that? What sense can we make of that? period, four to ten years out. And what does it mean for us now? What does it mean for the choices that we need to make to continue to have successful businesses into the future? Now, we like simplicity, don't we? So if we try to create time for change and try to simplify and tackle the complexity, then maybe we start to look at the customer interface process inside our organisation. Think about the systems and information, the regulatory framework, and what it means for people. But I wouldn't want you to think that my advocacy here is to make everything simple and, and job done. Because I don't think it is. Because we may need to do some of this so, to help us make sense. But let's think about that in the context of the reality that we're in. The reality we, that we are in is an exponential change in technology and an associated radical accelerating change in the way that we do things within our businesses. I quite like this approach from Steve Jobs. Uh, and I've touched on this a couple of times. So the start point is the customer experience. This is kind of the Uber and the Airbnb approach. What is it the customer experience is? What is it that we think we can do better? Forget the technology for now. Just think about the experience of the consumer and the customer. Once we know that, what are the technology solutions, technology solutions we have to deliver that? And then, with those two pieces in mind, how does that influence the shape of our business, the business model redesign potentially that we have to do. And that's what those successful exponential businesses are doing. They're starting with the customer or the consumer, then identifying how the technology can respond to those needs. <clears throat> so I think to summarize what I'm talking about here is how do we take our businesses beyond machine learning? How do we balance the masculine and feminine? And I don't mean male and female here. What I mean is if we think about traditional business. Traditional business is about taking everything for us. It's about profits. It's about bringing these new, big, powerful uh, technologies to bear. But maybe going forward into the future, what we actually need to think about is what are the softer skills that we need? How do we continue 
to make sense of what our consumers need. How do we think about the people within our organisations? So some of these leadership skills about sense-making, about trying to understand the future, about empathy as well, about the way that we work with our colleagues, they're some of the, some of the more feminine traits, I think, that we've, up till now, started to lose from our businesses. And I think that's what I think we need to do to take on these notions around extraordinary leadership, to rebalance between the masculine and the feminine, if we truly want to create a very human enterprise. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was a wonderful, thought-provoking look at where the future is going and what the impact will be on the society. I think, you know, often as technologists, we think a lot about the future of technology and not so much about its implications of technology on society. So thank you very much for bringing that perspective uh, to this conference. I think it's been wonderful hearing you talk and thank you so much for coming down from UK to do this. Uh, so Steve is around and I would encourage all of you to interact with him. You know, he speaks at a number of conferences on the future of technology, the future of business, the future of AI. So I encourage you to pick his brains and, you know, to learn as much as possible while he's here. Uh, we, we'll arrange to distribute the presentation, you know, uh, we'll, we'll send it out to everybody. Yeah? So thank you so much, Steve, for being here. Thank you. Uh, so, so, big round of applause for you. Uh, thank you.